Earlier this week, Jewish people all around the world observed the high holy day of Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is a day of forgiveness, a day of seeking forgiveness for the mistakes and errors and sins of the previous year. But even more than forgiveness, Yom Kippur is a day of atonement, a time for seeking out those you've hurt or harmed and in those you've hurt or harmed in the past year and atoning for those mistakes, repairing those broken relationships so that you might begin again in love in the new year. And even more than forgiveness or atonement, Yom Kippur is a day of what in Hebrew is called teshuvah. Teshuvah can be translated as repentance, but also as turning. Earlier in the service, we read Jack Reimer's words on turning, on teshuvah. It means recognizing we have the ability to change. These things are hard to do, but unless we turn, we will be trapped forever in yesterday's ways. God, help us to turn from callousness to sensitivity, from hostility to love, from pettiness to purpose, from envy to contentment, from carelessness to discipline, from fear to faith. Turn us around, O oh God, and turn us toward each other, God. For in isolation, there is no life. Forgiveness, atonement, returning, turning, change, teshuvah. Let me tell you a little piece of trivia that I love. In the Jewish tradition, Rosh Hashanah, which was um, about 10 days before Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah is the celebration of the Jewish New Year. And then each year, a little over a week later, comes Yom Kippur, the day of repentance and atonement. And my own inner cynic has always regarded this fact as humorously backwards. You're only a few days into the new year, and already it's time to forgive and atone. I don't know. You don't find that funny, though. I, I find it. I find it. I find it a little. Uh, this, there's there's a little bit of there's a little bit of weirdness there. But let me let you in on a little ministerial secret. I'm in my 14th year of ministry, and every single fall, I've preached a sermon about some aspect of forgiveness in September or October. We're only a few weeks in to the church year, and it's time already for a sermon on forgiveness. Last summer, when I was thinking about my preaching calendar for the fall, I wanted to make sure I wanted to, to look up when Yom Kippur would fall. And so I opened my search engine and I began to type, when is Yom Kipp? And you know how a search engine will automatically fill in the rest of your sentence with possibilities of what you may be searching for? Well, as I typed, the options appeared asking me if I was asking, when is Yom Kippur in 2016? When is Yom Kippur in 2017, in 2018, in 2019? And that, as that flashed up on my screen, that struck me as a revelation, as a revelation perhaps about the human condition. The calendar has spoken, and we've already not only planned to atone for this year's errors and failings, <laughs> but we've already scheduled our day of forgiveness and atonement for mistakes we'll make in the coming year and mistakes we're sure to make three years from now and five years from now. And in that moment, I pondered out loud, can people change? Can people change? Decided that'd be a good title for a sermon. How would you answer that question? If I were to ask you, can people change, how would you respond? I mean, we have to answer yes, right? I mean, it is possible, isn't it? It has happened in the annals of recorded history. <laughs> I've seen it with my own two eyes. I've seen people change. But within the received wisdom of our culture, there's a lot that casts doubt on our capacity for change. For the cover of the order of service this week, I selected a cartoon that I found rather humorous. Who wants change? All the hands go up. Who wants to change? All the hands go down. And who among us would say that there is some existential truth to this cartoon, right? That this cartoon reveals something about the human condition that's true. We know 
The leopard cannot change. You cannot teach an old dog. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new. That's from Ecclesiastes, from the Bible. Hmm. We knew those pretty well, didn't we? <laughs> There's a scene from the old movie Annie Hall, which is so indicative of how difficult it is to change. Woody Allen's character, Alvy, is talking with Diane Keaton's Annie. And uh, Alvy asks, oh, so you see an analyst. Yeah, Annie replies, just for 15 years. 15 years, Alvy exclaims. Annie answers, yeah, I'm going to give him one more year, then I'm going to Lourdes. <laughs> UU minister Nancy Schaefer of Blessed Memory has a spiritual poem that I cherish, the title of which is For Margaret, Who Fights the Same Battle Over and Over. The poem is about a woman named Margaret who we learn grew up in a religious tradition that soured her on matters religious that left her stuck and angry, fighting the same battle over and over again with the religious upbringing that she had. Nancy Schaefer writes, Those who taught you what to pray and how to pray were wrong if what they taught you you hate. You can begin again. Perhaps this image of someone fighting the same battle over and over has purchased with us. Perhaps you know somebody who fights the same battle over and over. Perhaps you fight the same battle over and over. Whether that's a string of relationships with similar results or jobs with similar results or a cycle that repeats itself, that reproduces itself. A relative that has got your number and you'll know what will happen when you two get together. It always happens. Oops, made that same mistake again. Perhaps you know somebody who fights the same battle over and over. It goes without saying that there is a timeliness to this message. Just as an individual, an individual can be stuck in a, in a limiting pattern of thought or a destructive habit, we also know that our nation right now is stuck in destructive patterns, in cycles and systems that perpetuate dysfunction and engender hate and heartlessness, racism, misogyny, religious intolerance, militarism. We recognize that there is a need for turning, for teshuvah, don't we? Don't we? How many people want change? How many people want to change? Change is hard. Change is hard. How many of us have ever embarked on an intentional program to try to change themselves, to try to make some significant life change? We know if we look out that change is big business, that there's therapy and psychoanalysis and the self-help movement. There's spiritual practice. There's coaching, mentoring, 12-step programs, religious organizations. All of these are about helping people along on this change they so deeply desire. Physically, we know there's a seemingly endless variety of diets, exercise choices, makeovers of the extreme and less extreme variety. And I would just ask ourselves to notice, to notice that if changing ourselves is hard, and it is, if it is challenging to change yourself, it is a lot harder to change somebody else, to change another person. How many of us have learned that lesson? So if change is something we want, and if change is, is big business with a thousand different change gurus peddling promises of change, what makes change so difficult? Why is it so hard to change? I think to, the answer to this is that change is often disruptive. One of my favorite books about change is a novel called How to Be Good by the popular British author Nick Hornby. He wrote uh, About a Boy and um, High Fidelity and Fever Pitch. The story is about the marriage of Katie and David. 
And at the beginning of the book, we're introduced to both of them. Katie is good. Katie is a doctor who derives great personal meaning from working to heal and care for people. She lives a virtuous life, involved in her community, cheery helper. And then we meet David, and David is, well, the opposite of Katie. We're introduced to him, when we're introduced to him, we meet an angry, sarcastic, critical, caustic man who is literally the author of a column in the local paper called The Angriest Man in Town. And early in the novel, David goes through a miraculous conversion. He meets a guru in the street who pow, changes him. All of a sudden, David becomes good. Instead of seeing the worst in everyone, he sees what's best about their humanity. Instead of criticizing, he empathizes. His sarcasm gives way to total earnestness. And he is determined to walk what he talks, which, of course, affects his wife and children. He begins by giving away his son's computer to the shelter for battered women. He invites homeless street children to stay in the spare bedroom. His life becomes radically other-centered in a way that any of us would have a tough time relating to, and his family definitely has a tough time relating to. And what happens is, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, Katie begins to change in the story. She begins to get shorter with people. She begins to get more negative, more cynical, as David gets, as David gets, becomes a saint. She falls into this path of cynicism and even self-doubt. She must be a shock to her. She begins to doubt everything, begins to doubt that she was ever as good as she thought she was. And so I give this example, I won't spoil the end of the book, but I give this example to show that change, change is, is disruptive. I reached out to um, a member of our church, a psychologist in our church, Brian Sexton, to ask him about change. And so I asked Brian, I said, uh, he's a he's professor of psychology at Duke. I asked Brian, so, so can people change? What do you, what do you have to say about, about how people change? And Brian wrote back to me with, with one example that I like. He wrote to me about work that he's doing around the sensation of awe and wonder. And he says that, that the work that's being done in this field, it's a field that hasn't been studied much, but the work that's being done in this field shows that when people have even a brief experience of awe or wonder, might be looking through a telescope, looking through a microscope, seeing a, you know, one of those National Geographic pictures of the Grand Canyon or um, the Great Barrier Reef or a place on Earth that is miraculous, that, that that experience of awe actually changes people, makes them more patient, more altruistic, causes them to seek out relationships rather than material products, it leads them to say they have a greater life satisfaction that that experience of awe changes people. From our own tradition, from our own tradition as Unitarian Universalists, it is without doubt that we are a tradition that has believed in the capacity to change. William Ellery Channing, who was one of the founders of Unitarianism, William Ellery Channing um, had this experience as a as a child, he was brought by his father to a revival where there was fire and brimstone preaching. And he went and he heard the fire and brimstone preacher talking about damnation and talking about the need for everybody to, to be born again, to change right now. And then it ends and everybody walks away and goes to lunch and his father goes home and, and sits in front of the fireplace and puts his feet up and smokes a pipe. And William Ellery Channing goes over to him and says, don't we have to change? 
And the father says, oh, well, that's just talk. But Channing, Channing took this lesson. Channing took this lesson. And he, some of his rejection, some of his rejection of the religious options of those times were actually grounded in this desire, in this desire for a religious belief system in which human change is possible, not the Calvinism that says we're already predestined, but rather a theology that says human nature is pliable and changeable. Channing went and invented a concept called, called self-culture, this ability to change one's self for the good. As Unitarian Universalists, I would ask that we continue in that legacy, that we hold out hope, hold out hope against hope, that change is possible. Hold out hope that change is something worth believing in. Recognizing that it's hard, hard for ourselves and certainly hard to change someone else but finding that it is worthy of our being, worthy of our believing, worthy of our lives. Amen. Shalom. Blessed be.